שלום מייקרופונס, nice to meet you one by the other, they are working. <laughs> I want to say that if, if there is paradise, I think it looks very similar to what we had this morning. Um, I had a great pleasure to visit the Chevrutot and I learned a lot, a few points that are new to me from today and I thank you. And I want to say, it might be obvious, but I so deeply believe that this is how people, children and grown-ups should study. The whole concept of listening to lectures from teachers is so not working for me. <laughs> Even when I lecture, I get bored. <laughs> and, I <laughs> and I love Hevrota. It's such an amazing educational concept and, and uh, tool. And I don't know why still there are no complete schools, not just yeshivot, that would teach children like this, because when you put text or any kind of question material on the, on the table, and you let people have a real conversation and intimately meet the other person's point of view, this is the closest I ever get to really moving, studying, changing in my mind. I feel like a kaleidoscope of thoughts in my mind that really change when I hear someone talk or speak and, and the, the, the time flies so easily, it's, it's so nice. So uh, if there is already a school like that, let me know, I'm coming. And if not, we should start one. I mean, it's, it's always so amazing that the most um, cutting edge ideas are so ancient and that the, the text comes with, a, with how to study it. Zero. Now we can really start, right? We have an hour and a half, and we have three stories. So it's, uh, let's try and give something like 25 minutes to each of the stories. Please watch your watches. I left mine somewhere. And let me know if we are too long on one story, because the others need uh, some treatment also. And remember that after lunch, anyone who has more things to say or ask, toda raba, nice watch, be careful, <laughs> you don't forget it here. Um, if anyone has more questions or things to say, I'm going to be back here at 1.30, so we are in great leisure and there's time. I... I, by the way, when I was walking um, with Chevrotot and sitting with different Chevrotot, I noticed, of course, that there is a big difference between Chevrotot that were from one gender or more. And these texts, especially, as you pointed out, are very worthwhile uh, studied. I'm not sure this was an English sentence. Excuse me for the recording. These texts invite us to study them with people from our gender and the other or others. Um, and I feel that since from this house, from uh, Hartmann, I came out and established together with Moti Baror Elul, which was, uh, I think, then the first and the only egalitarian uh, Bet Midrash uh, of secular and uh, religious, uh, secular and orthodox women and men, um, as house of study, Bet Midrash, together, not where secular people came to be taught, but where we came to teach and study together. And then, this is 30 years ago, I saw that the, the guys that came from, usually from Yeshivat Agush, most of them, and from other Kotel and some Haredi, uh, Orthodox Yeshivot, I saw their amazement when we studied Nashim together, when we studied any issue that speaks about women. Be for me, everything was amazing, because I never saw these texts before. But for the men that felt that they know the text already and that they've studied it, they always studied it in the men's locker room. When they talk about women, as they do here, 
they talk to women with men and they get uh, reactions or other views from other men. When you bring Torah into a room where men and women are studying together, you get so much uh, new gifts. The first one is for us as women to listen to men talking about women. This is part of the joy of studying uh, Talmud that is a very male text. When they talk, and they talk a lot about women and what women are and what we want and how to handle us and how to live with us and why are we angry, which is usually the big question of <laughs> behind every angry woman there's a man that is asking himself, what happened? <laughs> is it my fault? <laughs> usually... I'm saying this from my male side. <laughs> so uh, when you get the opportunity to read in length, in depth, what they think women are and what they want of them and, and uh, how to live with them, it's fascinating and it's very enriching to anyone who wants to have a relationship with men. The other side of it, of course, is for men that they have the opportunity to listen to women reading and listening to this talk about themselves and in, in to what level can we identify uh, or understand what you say when you say Nashim Datan Kala what first of all as a woman I need to understand what do you mean, what did he mean what did they say in that room and what was Buria thinking when she was in the other room in the kitchen, in my imagination, stirring the milk, the, the soup for everyone when they will take a break in their studies, and she hears them saying, Nashim datan kalot en alayhu, and she's melagleget, she's smiling, she's smirking, she's something. It's not that she went to the other room and started yelling. She didn't throw... My mother used to throw soft cover books at my father sometimes. It was one of the things that was done in our house. Books were flying. And then I knew that she's not happy with something he said. But Buria did not do anything of that sort. She liglega. Was it inside? Was it outside? We don't exactly know. Um, so the second thing I wanted to say about Hevrutot is that it's very worthwhile to study together. And when you teach in your congregations or classes, it's just even letting two people read it and, and allowing each other to try to understand what... It's such a gift to understand sometimes how, what people see in us. We always, when we see ourselves, we see one reflection, but when other people are generous enough to tell us what we look like. It's, a, it's, an, it's like listening to your voice uh, when it's recorded. It's not what you hear. And it's also you. So that's the, the other thing. Um, another little thing that I learned in the Chevrotot and I'm happy about is that Hebrew is still alive in North America. And that's a very important thing in my, to my mind. I know it's challenging. I know it's difficult. I know American culture is not about other languages. And it's not just because of, it's not Jewish or it's not, this thing is not only about us. America is not, doesn't like many languages. It's speaking uh, English, American English. But, but the fact that you read, a lot of you read the Hebrew and went into the details of Kisufa versus uh, uh, Busha and to, and um, Reminhu, and I, I felt I was, I enjoy that, and I do think that everything is translatable, and the Talmud says that bechol lashon, you can pray, God, God listens to all languages, and, and study is possible live in sign language and in any language. But I do believe, and I'm sorry, I allow myself, although I might be stoned with peaches here, <laughs> but I do believe in Hebrew. I do believe that studying these texts in their... Um, I don't know if original, the original way they were written or thought or taught or talked gives you little extra bonus gifts. Like, for example, liglega. Liglega is not, what does the English say? 
Radicule is radicule, but leglega has the onomatopoeia of leg, 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 like bakbuk, like tziftzuf, like those Hebrew words that give you the sound. So she was in the kitchen, and they were saying, Nashim datan kala, and she was leg, 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 leg. <laughs> That's all. So there are, there are these little things that, although it's fine and you understand everything in English, if you can uh, do the extra kilometer, <laughs> it's not a mile because it's in Hebrew. Um, I think there's a bonus there. Now the important thing, what is this session about? I was invited to try and talk about righteousness. And I'm choosing these three short stories, three little miniature um, dramatic drama stories that could very well be um, uh, translated into theater. They are very dramatic. They are built in scenes. In every scene, there's two protagonists. Um, and there's always very strong dramatic tension between two values that, that the audience can understand. And usually, I believe, these stories are built in a similar way to Greek drama to make us go through some kind of catharsis. The audience is supposed to somehow get into the story and feel the difficulty with the protagonist. And because these are not all happy ending stories, if any, you go through a kind of a catharsis that is asking you or inviting you to move in some very deep place in your soul and look at your life and change and be invited to think if you're not falling into the same place that the, the hero fell and next time you're in this tension, maybe you can choose a little differently. So these are working, spiritual working stories, again, like in Zen Buddhism, the stories are not stories of praise of rabbis. I don't think the Talmud goes there. The stories are not um, bedtime stories for children or nice stories of literature. They are not. They are stories that were written by scholars, anonymous scholars in the Babylonian yeshivot. And they are writing these stories, although they are not putting them, they are not staging them. They are not, there's no uh, end of the year uh, play unfortunately, but they play them in their imagination and they are like Zen stories, um, sessions that want to touch you and influence you and move you spiritually. And they are grown up, uh, like and many times like in the Zen stories, they, they slap you. They're not nice, they're not, they're not easy stories. It's when, this was translated in Hebrew to to the children's book, to tell t children stories about uh, rabbis. It's doable, but I think not enough um, hard reading, modern reading, of, that is talking about loneliness in, in a relationship. It is talking about the, the places that we... Uh, cheat ourselves, that talks about how difficult it is to be in a relationship, that talks about the tension between body and soul and spirit. Not enough of that is, is taken out, and this is what I'm trying to do here. So I see these three stories as, as three examples or three exercises in being righteous. Three couples that wanted to be righteous. Three of the famous righteous uh, heroes that we have in our Jewish culture. And what I said before, how do you implement it into the bedroom and into the kitchen and into the study hall? How, what, what is righteousness or what are the, what are the um, or obstacles of being human and righteous? So now we, we'll start with the first one which is really very hard to read. Masechet Avodah Zarah 
says that Rabbi Meir he ran away from the Romans and he went into a prostitute house and came out and put his finger into something very not kosher and then licked the other finger and they said so this is not they were chasing him they were they thought they are they found him but because he was licking the other finger they said well this can't be Rabbi Meir and they left him this is very funny it's like the when Elisha Ben Avuya decided to become not halachic, uh, he, he, he understands that there's no justice in the world and he's angry and he's going and he's going to show the world that he's not playing the game anymore and he goes to a prostitute and he takes a turnip from the ground and he pulls it out and the prostitute is like wow <laughs> that's really shocking he took a turn Okay, no, but you know the, the, it's like a young yeshiva bucher that is sure that the first time he uh, drives on Shabbat, the whole world is his rabbis and the other car next to him and watching him and the whole world is in charge. Imagine that prostitute. That's not the most harsh thing that she saw on, the, on her shift. That a young guy took a turnip out of the ground on Shabbat. When she says, you are not Elisha, it couldn't be. It's funny the, how they portray a prostitute. Maybe next year I have a collection of beautiful uh, prostitute figures that they, 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 they like them. They are always the smart women that have seen a lot and they're not impressed with the righteousness of the, of the rabbis that come to them. But, um, and they usually teach them a lesson. But um, where was I? Oh, so, <laughs> so they want to be righteous. And in, so, so Rabbi Meir uh, fled and he tastes and this and, and they say come Arak Atalebaveli. This is the scene where he leaves Eretz Israel and he moves to Bavel. And that's a very big move for someone that built all his career and all his students and, and Bet Midrash. He's Rabbi Meir. Everything that all his teaching is here. He leaves and he goes away to Bavel and the Bavli says Ikadamrei some say, because the Romans are chasing after him. And some say, because of what happened with Bruria, Bruria. And they go on. They don't say what is the Maase Bruria. Only in the Rashi, on the page, he says Maase Bruria. And he gives us the following story. And we know that Rashi takes the following story from writings that he has from the time of the Geonim. Yeshivot in Babylon, after the time of the Talmud, run by Geonim, have writings that survived. And there are many, not many, but I know some dozen stories that were censored out of the Talmud for different reasons, but were left in the writings of Geonim and coming back through Rashi. That's something that is known to happen. I'm not sure. I have no way to, I don't have another, we never found yet another Avodazara uh, manuscript that has it in it. But this is what uh, scholarship thinks today. So this is the status of uh, the story of Buria. Now let's uh, try and let's take to uh, telling of the story, if you may, one by a woman and one by a man. You don't have to identify with Rabbi Meir if you are a man or a woman or otherwise. But what really happened? Is anyone willing to give us a brief? What happened in the way your Chevruta read it? Please, but in a generous voice. Yeshiva Bocha was reading, it's 
chapter over and over and over again, each each of them, by the way, and finally this is there, and when we realize what he has done, he seems to show himself, and then I would say, Rabbi, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another option of reading that uh, some Hevruta was holding and wants to present, please? Thank you. The two very uh, persuasive uh, options of reading. Um, it is a very hard uh, story. It's of course hard for all of us who respect and appreciate Rabbi Meir, and it's difficult to understand what's, what, what made him do this. I want to read this on the side of a righteous, a person that wants to be a righteous person. And I'm sure Rabbi Meir is and wants to be a righteous man. What I think many of the women here would like to understand, uh, but I'm not sure that men in our time know more than women in our time. What did the rabbis say when they said, Nashim Datan Kala? What do you think is the... This is like meeting chauvinism uh, face to face, right? Sometimes when we read classic text, we are meeting beliefs or ideas that, that ran in our family that are hardcore annoying. <laughs> and and uh, w what I do when I meet it, I am not, I'm trying not to spend too much energy and time in being angry. It's, it does, the fact that it is written there doesn't mean that it's the only truth or that it's against me or that it's uh, the only way to be Jewish. But it's part of our heritage. And the first thing I do is try to understand what, how, <laughs> how far does it go? What does it really say? So let's just try to understand what does it mean being righteous men, the men in the room, what did they mean when they said Nashim Datan Kala? We know that they say it in other places in the Talmud and they say that you shouldn't teach uh, a woman Torah, Talmud. What do you think they mean when they say uh, Nashim Datan Kala? Yes. I, I, I think it's a version of what you were saying. I think it, it's La Donna e Mogale. A, wom a woman is, uh, in this version, is different. It's somebody who I want to say thank you, and it's it's interesting to think that on that men would think that of women. Well, yeah, that's a notion of yes, please, and yes, please. We think of you lightly, you mean. The, the, the world does not, I understand. And yeah. Okay.
order. Thank you. I think you, you gave a generous uh, uh, understanding of it. I'm, I'm sorry I can't uh, listen to everyone now. We'll, we'll go on. I, I, I want to say that um, Bruria is the one woman that is quoted and is taken not so lightly because she knows 400 halachot uh, kelim and she's quoted in her name in Mishnah. Uh, no other women and uh, ever it's like she was accepted to the the college that is only for men and she she was given uh, um, a name to to teach and to say all of that about Bruria it's really pushing it uh, very hard and we know all the other stories about Bruria and Rabbi Meir and the family of Bruria and we know that they are uh, a kind of Holocaust survivors. We know her sister is in in jail, is in a prostitute house, and we know she lost her father watching him being burned, um, covered with a scroll of Torah, and she talks to him when he's uh, being killed. And and so there's, she is like the son that was never born to Rabbi Hanina ben Tradion, and when he is killed by the Romans, uh, with the Torah around him, she is like ordained to be his successor. And so she has this historic and family obligation to study Torah and maybe also the, the ability and talent. And, and she is married to Rabbi Meir, who on his side we know was a very l alone kind of person and not understood by his by the other scholars. And we know that in his scroll of Torah that he got, people, you know, they didn't have libraries and there were no books in their world. And people that wanted to have a scroll of Torah would pay a scribe or sometimes themselves would write themselves a book or the whole Torah and then they would have one. And he had his own Torah. And instead of uh, on Tuesday, Beom Shlishi, to say, Ve'ar Elohim Kitov, he wrote Tov Mavet. Instead of Tov Me'od, he wrote Tov Mavet. Death is good. And people talked about that but didn't exactly understand what kind of, what kind of philosophy, what kind of a concept of the world he has. So there is Buria, is an interesting character and I'm sure a righteous person. And she has a she has a she has work in this world that she believes she ha she must do through Torah, and Rabbi Meir also is a, that's his life journey. But there's a lot of loneliness between them, and the fact that when they say that to say to someone that had such a history, women's had a light weight, uh, light headed. I completely identify with the with the Liglug. I mean, it's not right about her. And also, we know the story of the, uh, the other rabbi that wanted to walk with her, and she corrects him. And when she, when the, instead of killing the neighbors that make noise, she says, let's kill the, 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 the bad doing, not the people. She's teaching all the time. And maybe the difficulty here is not that she's lightheaded, but that she's so strongheaded and so dominant. And so knowing better that that's another challenge of the man trying to live with women when she is so good in what is supposed to be our domain. And, and the Talmud is quoting her being more right than him, which is not something that we like uh, to happen in public. Uh, and with our closest person, it, it, that, there's a lot of tension in that family or in this household. But then when he says Chayaich, he's making an Shvu'a, an oath, you will end up agreeing to this. What happens there? Okay. 
raises the stakes. Yeah, it brings. Yeah, please. That's very, yeah, he brings out this, uh, this tension from in the household. You know how sometimes in relationships when someone brings out, says the word, so maybe we'll separate or... Then the word begins to work, begins to live. Milim meyatrot metziut, words create reality. So he is creating in a moment a kind of a war that he opens, uh, and you will, you, you will, uh, uh, what was it? Acknowledge that uh, it is true. Yes, I see that. It's very beautiful because it's irony, and a man wrote it. <laughs> a man wrote an ironical use of Nashim Datan Kala when a man, Dato Kala, and not only that he's moved emotionally and not from the mind, he's acting out on it in a terrible, destruct destructive way. But I always go back to remembering that a man wrote it. It's so, it makes it so much more um, uh, impressive that they can be so self-aware. Yes, please. There's something very... Um, um, offensive about committing suicide in uh, yeah and he and he really huh? it's, hostile. it's hostile yes it's it's the only kind of weapon that she had into um ken I'm, I'm i see here in this beautiful watch that we are coming to the end of the time of the buria story i just want to say something uh the, the the drama is not only between them, the use of the student, the, the Humrim, uh, harassment of a student that is like a son to make him many, many days. So it's a whole period of time. So this student has lost his uh, integrity uh, and we are past any thought of righteousness when he is made to do something that is both a sin and killing slowly a woman that he respects. And the, the fact that she wakes up one day and she understands that all this intimacy and belief that she has a friend and that something real is happening to her. And there is some, as you said before, some, I don't remember who uh, you said before, that there was some kind of warmth there and intimacy and all of that is the lie and she that kind of halash da'ato of the Talmud is always when someone realizes that what you believe your life is is not actually the truth one of the most frightening and painful moments that a person might feel that you live in a lie and things are not what they seem to be it's very shocking and and uh, shake shaking uh, yes please And all of this, all of this, living in the world of Torah, the whole situation is situated in a, in, a, in the context of a teacher, student, wife. That's a triangle that works in many stories. There's a lot of tension, uh, like uh, remember Chuma and Abaye and Rava, who do you love more, your wife or your colleague at work? 
Who do you spend more time with? Uh, you, you know, the men that go to work in the morning and have someone that has built the business with them and they see him every day and they are mates. And then there's the family and the wife out there. There's jealousy between the... That's another triangle. Here, again, the, the student that... There's the, the enkochot. It's not even equal power and a whole of destruction. But I want today to put it in the context of righteousness. To be too righteous, to be a kanai, to be, how do you say it, kanaut? Zalet, even on Pinchas we say Zalet? I thought Zalet is only for Romans. <laughs> to be so uh, harsh on a good thing, with no, my father would say in Spanish, I don't know if it's Bulgarian or Spanish, he would say sometimes that Someone or some situation is overseas. There's no air. It's like tight and it's like vacuum. There's no air in it. In this couple, there was no air, no flexibility, no humor, no acceptance of humanity. So he can say, you know, Buria, it's hard for me. You're always right. Give me a chance. <laughs> Don't, at, at least not in front of my colleagues. This is something that is very easy to, to hear. It's very difficult to say. And the competition in a couple is something that is not supposed to happen. Uh, one of the, you know, all those sentences that a man is never jealous of his child or student or wife. All of the above are not always right. And what do you do when there's competition beginning to happen in a couple? And how do you air it? How do you make little holes so the Jealousy will go out and you'll be able to accept yourself with what you said before, this human gut feeling that you throw in the women, but actually happened to Rabbi Meir, that he's angry. A simple anger that could be completely understood. But when it's not treated and not talked about, it can really kill. Yes, a little listening and then we go to Cheruta. Seder? Please. What I think, I think that he caught himself meaning to be righteous, but really abusing. He understood what he did, and, and the fact that it was known when she died, um, I think he left. I think he, in some ways, committed suicide in a rabbinic way. Uh, scholars have other ways of committing suicide. They can, there's one scholar that decided he's not going to talk anymore. Rav Shimi Rav Papa. And when you don't, if your work is in talking and you decide you'll never talk again, it's like killing yourself or leaving your world. You might live another life in Babylon, but when you are all immersed in Hebrew and in Israel and you are living your power, living your position, living your name, Losing your, your reputation, it's in some ways for me both died. That's very deep in, the, in their psychology. I hear you, but I want to say that psychology does not answer when there's does not explain sin. You can explain the anger. You can explain the, the, the terrible agony that they live in, the distance between them after the death of the children, where she was so righteous not to even cry. And that's also disturbing in some way in that story. But to act out on it is, is moving from psychology. Behind you, yeah. A 
that's very beautiful. I thought, I, th I thought of the Garden of Eden in Cheruta, but I didn't think of the Garden of Eden here. And it's so beautiful what you say that both in the Garden of in Eden and here in Buria, the woman is, uh, is uh, accused of eating the fruit, but it's really the, <laughs> the, she was set up and the snake and the lie and so on. And there's a moment. Oh, that's very beautiful. Um, I, I just wanted to think of that, that moment after uh, Buria, after Eve ate the fruit before she gave it to Adam, when she knows and he doesn't know yet. And it's interesting to think of it here. She, he knows and she doesn't know. And that's very interesting, the melody of faith, thank you. And there's always the other, the snake, the student. There's someone else that is set up by, it's a chidush for me. Yes, and yes, and then we go to her. And, and that, both here and in paradise, once you know you're thrown out of paradise, the knowledge is the, the, the death of their world. Please. That's also so interesting things that happen in couples when your friend, your partner says something about you in front of others. It's so much more painful than something that could end up very easily at home. But why would you, to kind of make um, Brit uh, with the other against your own, okay, everything, everything here is not things that we don't know from real life today. And and I want to take this story and and bring it into our life today. Okay. Struggling, and yeah, rest. Yeah. How do we breathe? Thank you. How do we br uh, breathe air into a relationship and into our own fears? It, I the last uh, couple of weeks I'm practicing breathing, and I realized that I haven't been breathing for so many years. Just to breathe into those fears, those uh, pains, those jealousy, all the, to, 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 again, what I opened the morning with, to allow yourself to be a human being. And I, I think that's something that the, the whole project of the Talmud says, that the fact that we are human is not a weakness. There's no... A existence that is bigger than being human with the weaknesses and anyone that tries to run away from it and be above it will find himself as Rav Chia Barashi in a, in a minute less than it if you try to be more than human you will end up lower than a human so okay let's change a page to Ken Why is the story here? One is maybe it happened. And if it happened, it's a tragedy that was, was, was uh, told from generation to generation. 
Um, but I think even if it did happen or something similar to it happen, uh, stories of husbands that do it to, to their wives uh, appear in Greek drama uh, of the time. Uh, that's like a classic uh, episode or... Um, I think my, my understanding of all these stories are, as I said before, stories that come to, to refine us as human beings, to make us more aware, more critical of ourselves, to grow. Of what it is, I think the scholar that is a man and has a wife writes a story about a scholar that is a man and has a wife and ended up killing her and losing his world. And he's saying to the other guys, look and listen and pay attention. Uh, and about in the issue of how we live with women, um, and, and I think he's saying what you said. We call them lightheaded, but we are really so many times, and, and it's more dangerous when you have the power. Uh, when women were under the power of men, this is, this is one of the sad stories of what happens uh, every day in many households. Uh, so that's really, the, I think, the worst tragedy. So we'll go more and more optimistic towards lunch. Uh, let's take Geruta. Geruta now has a very good uh, time. She's popular. Uh, I saw uh, an essay that someone wrote on different interpretations of Geruta, and I heard today that Noam Tzion is writing a book. Is he here? He's writing... Noam, Shar Koach. And I'm looking forward to hearing it, that you really look at the broad, all the interpretations of Geruta. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad and happy about that because she is really a character that was not so known or talked about. And uh, she's now back on stage of at least liberal Jewish study. I'm not sure that she's doing so well in uh, ultra-Orthodox yeshivot. But um, Geruta is a name, a famous name of a famous prostitute. Um, they have this notion of the prostitute in Paris. They are not Paris. They say the, the far away, very expensive prostitute. And you know the story is that there are rabbis that are collecting money and saving money in order to one day go to the famous prostitute in Europe. I always think it's in Europe. Because where would you put a famous... And uh, so... Geruta has a beautiful name, uh, um, professional name for, a, for an imagined prostitute in the mind of a man, because it's not such joy to be in a prostitute in the real world, but in the mind of a man that thinks there is a woman and she is free. She is Hacherut, like Tnuat Hacherut. She is liberty itself. She is the Statue of Liberty, but moving. She is a woman that has no obligations. She doesn't have a husband. And she's enjoying it. It's all the, the imagination of a character. She's enjoying having light-headed relationships uh, with men. And uh, she's famous to be the free woman. Uh, it's interesting. We heard on the news recently that there's some... Um, medication that women are supposed to take now in order to be more uh, uh, to have more libido and, and the question when I heard it was uh, is it working for women or is it working for men it's kind of a, a geruta kind of medication that is supposed to make women uh, happily freely excited about having uh, we're, we're not doing so well with the light headed women today it's the men are becoming, there are all kinds of people and it's not divided to men and women. Anyway, so she is like a character in the, in the scene, but the story goes that Rav Chia Barashi, again, a righteous man, even a little more righteous than needed. And what he does is that he's so 
worried or afraid or challenged by his evil inclination. And Yetzer Ara, evil inclination in Talmudic stories is usually about sex and not out of extracurricular uh, sexual relationship, not with your legitimate uh, husband or wife. Uh, he's so worried about it or, or it's chasing him or obsessed with it that he's praying every day this special prayer of Nefilat Apayim that is supposed to be the red phone that you only use if something really out of the ordinary happens. It's a strong prayer that you're not supposed to pray every day in such a way. A prayer where you, in the Bible, you do it outside. You lie on the floor, usually with a lot of people uh, seeing, and there is the Philat Apayim of Moshe and others in the Bible. In the Talmud, all the scenes of Nefilat Apayim, of this prayer, happen in the privacy of one's room. Nobody sees you. And you, not like we do Nefilat Apayim, that is a sublimation of, uh, and sometimes in Yom Kippur with a little uh, yoga mat. And <laughs> this is really throwing yourself on the ground and yelling your private prayer that is not from the prayer book and saying what hurts you. And it is considered um, an emergency prayer that God will hear immediately and help you and uh, get you out of this situation. What we see here is the, a man, a righteous man, that got into the habit of saying this prayer and acting out this choreography every day in the privacy of his home. Now he's married and there is a wife and still he is obsessed with his uh, evil inclination and he's asking for help from God every day. Now, what happened? Does it help? What does this do, this everyday prayer? What happens to this couple? And what, where, if I said air, how could they bring air into this situation? Because she doesn't even know that this, is, this all is happening. He does it when she's not home. She, what does she think? Why don't they have uh, any intimacy between them? He doesn't have a yetzer anymore and she's too embarrassed to embarrass him. She doesn't want to embarrass him, so she doesn't even raise the, the issue. What else can she be thinking? Huh? That she's not attractive? Could be. So she doesn't want again to raise it. I don't know if a woman would say that to herself. In my Midrash, if I remember right, she doesn't, but she doesn't see that until she found him praying. All the time before she saw it, before she saw the email, before she saw the text, <laughs> there's a moment where the philatapim is like texting or emailing because it's supposed to be private. But sometimes someone sees it. In this case, he was doing it every day. And one day he left the phone outside and she heard the noise and she couldn't help herself and she accidentally saw it. Please. In our group, there was a suggestion because we, one of the things that men have to do to get their wives is to give them money. And that if he wanted to be on a higher level, to be closer to God, that he would restrain himself and that she had to agree with that. That's very true. One of the things that, that is in the contract of uh, Jewish marriage in the rabbinic time is intimacy. And very nicely so, not that the woman is supposed to give intimacy to the man, as is used in the terms today in Hebrew. She gave, or she doesn't, she doesn't she give, or doesn't she give, that's how young people say. In the Talmud time, he gives. He's supposed to give. She's receiving but he's supposed to give. And he does not, and he needs her permission not to give her or, to, or some kind of reason. That's why I'm asking, what is she telling herself when she sees that he's not coming to her? So I think again in our obsession today with righteousness, 
I think there is a tendency by people who are very, see themselves very religious to fight the bodily uh, attractions and say, I'm above that. I, I don't need that anymore. I'm beyond sex and all of those. I'm, I'm a spiritual, uh, you know, I'm... And maybe she bought into that. She bought that. She, uh, she believed that he's so holy that... Um, and she gets the benefit of being the wife of a holy man that maybe doesn't need it anymore. I think all these days when they were not intimate, every day one of them could talk to the other. Either ask, like Ima Shalom will ask Rabbi Eliezer, or say something, but they don't. And the only way out where he's seeking help is he's talking to God, which is, in this case, not the right address. <laughs> God cannot help with this until you talk to your wife. But he is ashamed and embarrassed. And the righteousness lie to himself is that by doing so, not talking to her and keeping away from her and praying every day very strongly, he's doing the righteous thing. But he's, he's getting further and further away from a possibility to, to solve his problem and to be... A whole, a, a complete human being. And as you said, halakha is against him. Judaism or rabbinic Judaism is not impressed with monks. Is not impressed with people who go to study for 24 years and not coming back and not seeing their wife. That's a Christian thing. Uh, the vow that I'm going to choose God and not choose human beings. Judaism doesn't invite that. But once we are not invited to that, we are stuck with this everyday tension of trying to be uh, integrated between our bodily being and our spiritual and our uh, religious. Everything is supposed to somehow find a place together, but it's uh, hard to do that. And so they do not talk. He prays, she sees, then she understands. He does have inclination to someone, it's not to me, so what's going on? Again, she can talk to him and say, what is this? What, I saw the, your email, um, what is this? But she doesn't because she's embarrassed from, she doesn't want to get the answer. So she's making a kind of a test and only once she is um, hurt, through that hurt, and that's something that happens many times in the Talmud, through that ego pain of a woman that finds out that uh, the man that lives with her sees other women or is in, is in, has inclinations and so forth, through that pain, something new is born in her. And she is able to become, take part in the concept of uh, Cheruta, who is not a real character in the story. Cheruta never comes to visit. But the, the normal wife of Rav Vichia Barashi, whose name we don't even know, goes to Victoria's Secret and buys a whole wardrobe on the up, upper store. Uh, I think my daughter told me I, I, something. She said, this is a, a, a prostitute um, working clothes uh, ward. Like all kinds of things, uh, comfortable things to sleep with, <laughs> to sleep in, and she and she dresses up and she. Now it's it's her. She's not she she's not putting a mask on, but she is mitrapeset. Um, she is disguises or but she, it's disguise without disguise. She's just she's doing a what's called today a. Makeover, Nachon. Those shows when the mother is waiting and she comes out and everyone is crying for some reason. <laughs> so she makes a makeover, but she doesn't come out. She decides to meet him. Now, there's some... Here there is humor, Nachon. In this uh, um, 
option of paradise, there is some humor in the fact that a woman can play, can act out, can get dressed. And when you get dressed, it's a kind of a Purim story. And uh, she said, okay, let's play. And while after the, after the hurt, something new comes out, this playfulness, this, which is very sexy. And she acts and she, she does her nails and she colors her hair and she's all new. You know the feeling after you do your hair and nails, I'm sure I'm completely different. And then I go home and nobody sees any different. <laughs> Men are very difficult to impress. When they see you, you, my daughters or friends, immediately when I, I only knock on the door, she says, what did you do? But men, two weeks, and they, they didn't. <laughs> and then they will say, no dress. They're very uh, lovable. But they, they <laughs> different. The talent, uh, talents are in different places. So, but she does her hair, and she, and she does her nails, and she's all playful. And he, that day, goes to study in the garden. All of us as teachers know that when the students want to study outside, there will not be any learning that day. And when we agree, it's because we don't want to teach that day. <laughs> and so he goes to study in the garden next to the way where people walk. And she walks her Geruta walk. And she's all happy. And he really gets excited. Again, as we said, lovable creatures. And they meet each other finally after all this story where there's no meeting and no talking and no connection and now they do and everything is paradise in the backyard in the backyard um, but paradise uh, para paradise for like not the real paradise paradise for cheap paradise again yeah. Fools can, because uh, sad paradise, modern paradise. Uh, backyard, he comes and, he do, and they, they do it, I think. It, it's not necessary in the text that they actually do it, but teva'a in other places in the Talmud is they have different, um, different words for different ways of having sex. And teva'a is the one that is not personal. It's like there and then, it's like very hippie, foreign, uh, just meeting and having sex and that's it. Hook up, thank you. I don't have enough vocabulary in, the, in that sense. So they do that, but once, although they do the same thing or they do it together in the same place and they're married for so many years, they live very different stories. She lives a story of some kind of reconciliation and birth within her and growth and happiness and joyfulness. But he, unfortunately, and if uh, Jacob would not sleep with the sister of his wife and mistake her for his wife, we wouldn't believe that men can sleep with us and not know that it's us, but they, that's another talent that they have. He's there with her, but he believes that he's really sleeping with Cheruta, the great prostitute from Babylon. Maybe it's such a beautiful fantasy that it's hard to resist, and maybe just that's what he thought, because she told him, I'm Cheruta. So he thought she's Cheruta. And then the, the moment, the, there's the moment after. And the moment after, she says to him, this little mousy little wife with the apron and the gray clothes now comes out in all red and golden costumes and she becomes very strong and she says to him, jump up and get me a pomegranate, which also echoes Tamar and Yehuda, I want proof. And he, with all his dignity and pride and respectfulness in the community, uh, climbs up the pomegranate tree and gets a pomegranate and comes down to give her and she's gone. 
which is easier for the fantasy, because what do you do with Cheruta afterwards? It's not that you go and have coffee together and chat. It's, it's too expensive. Um, she's gone, and then he falls into this uh, depression of what did I do? All these years, I was trying to res Exactly this is what I was fighting against and trying to resist. And I was praying, and I did all the right things, and I never even went close to my wife, so it won't start. And here, what happened to me, and I'm lost, and I'm, I'm hating myself so much. And she's at home, after the shower, changed into her home uh, uh, peril. And he walks into the house, and she's all happy with uh, make, making him his favorite. Uh, what does he have? They always have lentils. That's what they always eat. <laughs> they say to each other, "Tegalgel imi ba'adashim." Will you? It's like lenagev chumus, legalgel adashim. So they eat. She made him his favorite dish, and he walks in, right into the oven. They have a big. The Talmudic time, you can see it in Katserin, in the Golan, they have a museum of Talmudic life, and you can see they, they have a big oven that is like tabun, that is both for heating the house, you sleep around it, and for cooking and baking. So it's a big thing. He comes into the house, whoops, into the fire. And she says to him, My hi, what is this? Makara. Everything is so good. We started a new chapter. We, I was reinvented. I'm so glad. We, let, let, we can do this again. And he said, and now from the fire, he gives the first um, confession. confession. Thank you. Sorry. I think so. You were so, I didn't hear. He gives the first confession. This is the first sentence that they actually say to each other in truthfulness, in being themselves. And he says, hachi v'hachi hava maase. As the Chavruta taught me today, how do you say it? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, he tells her the whole story, but he's confessing like you usually confess after it's all lost. It's, it's gone already. And he is on his way to losing it all. And he says, I lost it, I broke it, I'm no, I'm, I hate myself. And he's in the fire. It's painful. And she says to him, but it's not necessary. It was I. And he said, and there's a moment of hope. But he says, I'm sorry. I intended for the forbidden. You can read it on the past, saying, but I committed uh, a sin, even if it wasn't a sin, which is, again, not a very Jewish thing. In the way that I understand rabbinic Judaism, you are judged by what you do, not what you, by what you think. You are, there's a freedom of thought. You, do, you don't do what's uh, wrong or a sin. But he, because his righteousness from the beginning was asking him more than just being a human being and uh, doing the right thing or not doing the wrong thing, he wanted his mind to, he wanted to control his, his fantasies. He wanted to control his mind. He wanted to be more holy than human being. And he found himself sinful in the fire. And she, hand, she kind of gives him a hand and says, come out, we can live a full life of integrated uh, body and soul, and he says, I'm sorry, if it's you, I, I'm not attracted, uh, or he can't come back. There's, like, there's a bit of air coming into this relationship, but not enough, and we leave him suffering in this uh, oven until the Talmud says that uh, he died. More optimistic readers can make another ending. I, Hope the next day maybe he did come out, but uh, I don't really know. So Cheruta, again, I, I see or I want to present today as a text about righteousness when we have the evil inclination of being too holy or 
when you as rabbis are expected by people to be more righteous than, uh, how do you say about mothers, good enough mothers. You should be good enough rabbis. When you're expected to be real, perfect human beings, usually it's a slippery slope to a very dangerous place, place, both for you and for the people that are trying to push you there. And what I hear the Talmud say is this, this is the real evil inclination. Don't ever uh, let yourself try to make things clean. They are not clean. That's the way we are made. We are messy. And, uh, and the messiness is the, the way that things can be moving and the, there's some kind of life and some kind of drama in it. It's, no, you, can't bro you can't come our life like here to make a... It's not working. Please, yes. That's very beautiful what you said about the choreography of the story. They play with that many times of coming near and far with the lines of study and here the house, the garden, the house. It's always, if there's anyone here uh, that has any connection with the, the movie business, I'm saying for three decades now that these are necessary stories to be made into movies and they are very low cost because they are always happening in a room, maximum in a garden, back in the room. You don't need like Moses coming out of Egypt. That must have cost a million in Hollywood, all these uh, Egyptians that you need to pay or to move the, 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 the rivers to. No, it all happens like in very modern stories. Two people in the kitchen, then they move to the living room, then they go to the garden and they go back to the kitchen. That's it. Two sets of clothes, we are done. Yes, the far away brothers. Thank you for the reading of the story. The, the one thing that that I was missing in your in your reading, I really see a story about the uh, the difficulty of solving our time finding excitement in permitted sex. That which feels to me like a very universal problem. You know, how Mating in captivity. Esther Perel, my friend, has a book that says mating in captivity. How do you keep cheruta in the marriage? Yeah, it feels like the story is, is the story by the rabbis reflecting on Right, the right. But they, but they give you an option. It's a, if your watch is right, I have to finish and go to Ima Shalom, which is a hint about the same... Uh, issue, but they do face and honestly say there is a challenge with uh, with marriage for many years. How do we keep the excitement? And but they do, that's so. Uh, when uh, do you know Esther Perel's work? She's a she's a family therapist in New York, and she's working all the time about this this question. And when she started working. Fifteen years ago, when I was in uh, New York, we started with this story. We taught it in Tikkun Al Shavuot when we did it in uh, at the JCC in the Upper West Side, and I and she thought this is a, an amazing story for what psychology is saying today, which is first of all honesty, and second of all the way. Rabbi Chia Barashi's wife was able to find within herself the freedom. Cheruta is such a good, or libertina is such a good word for it. You need, you need, or you are invited to find some kind of uh, alienation or freedom in not seeing your partner as what you usually see them, and the hope that human beings have so many options of how you. Uh, how you 
how you reveal yourself. You can come from different places and there's something very modern in what they suggest, but he's not, he's not flexible. Again, it's about being, uh, what's the opposite of flexible? Rigid. Rabbi Meir and Buria are both very rigid because of all the good reasons, but there's no movement there. And Rav Chia Barashi is rigid. His wife has become much more flexible. I think they are aware of the challenge and they are trying to come up with some kind of an answer. Okay. Oh, sorry, Regani, I saw you before. You say Garcinan from his girsa. That's beautiful midrash. I believe the pshat of Garcinan is ligros to what you do with Mishnah is you, what is it? Ruminate. Ruminate. You chew on it. Uh, but that, that's also good for, but you made a beautiful midrash that he is like creating his Of what to do with Yetzer Ara, that he is, is they tried to eliminate Yetzer Ara and they caught him and put him in a tin uh, vessel, locked him, and that's exactly what he tr what they tried to do here. I'm I'm beyond that. I don't want to ch be challenged with that. Enough with it already. And then after a few days, no rooster jumped on no hen, and there were no eggs in Jerusalem, meaning uh, life was dull and there's no life. And they understood they have to let him go. But if we let him go, again, it's, it's impossible to leave. It's, by the way, I'm very kilu, happy for them that they have such a strong libido. I'm not sure that everybody we live with is so happily... Uh, alive and erotic like that. It's a very erotic life, very erotic world. Anyway, so they let him out, but they blind Yetzer Ara. So now he's, he's, he exists, there is ero, uh, Eros in the world, but a little, but blind. So they say now a man is not attracted to someone until he sees her and to his uh, family members. No. Uh, The, where, where do they uh, catch him? Yevamot Samech Gimel, Bavli. Beautiful uh, story. What does he look like? Uh, he's a kind of a lion animal. Uh, thank you. Yes, a woman's voice. The same word in Aramaic, the Veithu is his home and is his wife. But here, where do we have the Veithu? <laughs> ah, okay, so he, she, his home, his wife, but what is, the, so what is your question? Yeah. 
That's beautiful because when they meet, they meet outside of the home. And then she's not the way to. So maybe what you say here and that we need to note is that when a woman sees her role as being the home of someone, she's paying in the Eros side. And sometimes we need to throw them away from home. And uh, I, I want to go uh, into Ima Shalom. So only completely necessary. You need a please and then, because we have 10 minutes. And we don't mess with food here, yeah. right on time. That he thinks he's free in learning Torah, but she's free because she's Tanya Kame. She's teaching him how to be free, and that's important to read. But the other, the, 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 the other question for me at the end of the story, in the positive read, that they're being they're rebuking him for some of his yasuri. The problem though is that you could read, you, you could like the story is positive to me that I was my kavana was that the story is to say. Even though you're telling me it's you. it's you now, I can't be excited unless it's actually prohibited. Yes, that's what I thought. Yeah, that pro In other words, and that, that itself is a real possibility, even where the Inesco's perils were, that th it doesn't matter if you have an integrated... I don't, think, yeah, I don't believe that this is an issue that, that is solvable. Um, uh, Ishai Rosenzvi, that wrote a whole book about Yetzir Ara, about the evil inclination, he says that the... The draw is to, to, do, to do something that is submissive, Amrim? Sub so many words in English. <laughs> Transgressive? Yeah. To, 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 to cross a line. And that we need the feeling, the thrill of crossing a line. And when it's, they tell you, but it's not the real line, then it's not working. But, that, but we have imagination. You can find a way to cross the line within the other line, or not. So let's go to Ima Shalom. I don't want to leave uh, the good example of the good couple that I think was able to, to be righteous, to leave them without uh, lunch. So it begins with a, a piece of uh, Talmud that I don't appreciate at all, and I don't like. Um, of someone saying that he heard the angels saying that this is forbidden and this is forbidden, that when you are in intimacy, practically you are not allowed to do anything and you're not supposed to enjoy yourself and, and your, the, the, your chushim senses are not supposed to be in the way. You have to do it. You're not here to enjoy and finish. I'm sorry if I didn't give him... A, it didn't do him right, but I want to go to the Reminhu. The, ba the Talmud says, Reminhu, I'm throwing a contradiction to what you claim to be hearing from the angels. And I want to give you the example of Ima Shalom, beautiful name for a woman, Ima Shalom, like Abba Evan. Her first name is Ima Shalom the famous wife of Rabbi Eliezer, that is so also the famous sister of Rabban Gamliel from Tanurah She Lachnai. She's stuck between a very strong brother, that is the president, and a very strong husband, that is the strongest scholar of the last generation fighting with the uh, present generation. Very hard. It's the way I understood it when I was younger is uh, the Dallas character of uh, being married to don't remember the good guy, Bobby, Bobby, and being the sister of the bad guy, JR. That's Ima Shalom. So everything is going through her. She is loyal to her brother, who is very harsh, on her husband, who is, anyway, Ima Shalom. She says, the neighbors, this is the first time that we have girl talk, the, the women locker room. They talk between themselves and they come to her and they say, how did you make such beautiful children? Which is a stupid question. <laughs> what can you answer? But she takes it seriously. She doesn't, she's not annoyed. She doesn't tell them, go, she answers uh, respectfully and seriously. And she says, I'll tell you the, the, 
the menu, the secret. אינו מספר עם מי, he does not now, מספר as opposed to תובע, that we saw when Rav Chia Barashi came to his wife as Cheruta, תבעה, he demand, תבע, he came, he had sex with her but in a very strong and alienated way. לספר is to tell a story. נכון? ספרות is literature. לספר is to tell a story. This is a very special way of talking about sex and intimacy, which is the English word intercourse. I only learned that in this story. I didn't know that intercourse has an explanation of talking, inter-conversation. So sex in this way, or can be, a way of talking with each other. Not only that the body is talking with another body, but they say, you said that the angels say, you're not supposed to say any word. We are talking. When he מספר with me, he does it not in the beginning of the night when we go to bed, and not in the morning when we wake up, but he makes a special appointment, and we put in a special owl as an alarm clock, and we wake up at midnight. which is the time that people wake up to do tikkun, to study. It's not, I said in one chavruta, when we have business appointments, we set a time and we get dressed and we prepare and we read and we come and we drive and we do our work. But when we are doing the most precious thing with the people that we love most in the world, usually we do it when we are tired or when ala derech, when, when the children are not noisy and there's nothing on television and... Uh, If we wake up, it's like, and she says, no, in our house, it's at midnight, um, and think of the ancient world where they would go to sleep at, uh, in the dark, so eight, nine, they would fall asleep, wake up at five, six. So waking up at midnight is difficult. It's not what your body naturally does. No, but we do it at midnight. And when he mesaper, מגלה טפח ומכסה טפח, he covers and uncovers, which is again interesting, you can read it as something very unerotic, because it's all covered, but, but to cover and uncover is the secret of, of, of erotica in, in dressing up, what is covered and what is uncovered, so I, you can read it either way. And now the hard, the hard part, ודומה עליו כמי שכפאו שד, he looks like someone that is attacked by a demon, or possessed by a demon. Now this does not sound like what we see in the sex scenes in the movies. They never know how to do it. It's always like dim, because there's no way to, to film something. That it, anyway, I, I never saw, I think, a scene that works. But in the scenes that are trying to show people enjoying each other, They never look like possessed by a demon. It's not a pleasant scene to see your husband until you woke up at midnight and all of this process of covering and uncovering that he looks like he's really suffering or afraid or something that is not so nice. There is, if we we'll try very hard, we can read possessed by a demon in a nice way, but I don't, I didn't, I don't find it easy. And then I think the... The heart of this story, or the height of uh, this relationship. And I said to him, Matam, now this question that she asked him, why do you do that? Sounds like a little thing, but we see from the two other stories that Rav Chia Barashi and his wife, she never asked him, why, why do you do this? Why don't you come to me? And in... Uh, Uh, Bruria and Rabbi Meir, there's no asking why. It's very frightening today in 2015. I don't know how many couples in your congregations that are modern and liberal and open and we've read it all and done it all. How many people have the guts to ask their partners, why do you do that? Because the risk is that they might answer. The truth and the truth might be that what um, Rabbi Eliezer answers 
כדי שלא אתן עיניי באישה אחרת. I am doing all this work, all this practice, all this manual, because I have the evil inclination, like everyone else, and I'm trying to be with you. Now, it's not easy as a woman to understand that being with me is such a difficult endeavor, <laughs> that you need to work so hard in order to be here. But she asks, and he answers, And he says, it's difficult, it's not coming naturally to me, but I don't want my sons to be mamzerei alev, bastards of the heart. I want to be fully here. I want my mind and my body be in the sa- to be aligned. In, and in order to do that, I'm doing this uh, manual. I don't think that the manual is important at all, or working. But I think the fact that there is, Again, we have a family that is challenged with all the challenges that other families were challenged, but I think here we see real righteousness. And I think that real righteousness comes from the uh, omits, the courage of seeing ourselves for what we really are and seeing our relationship for, for what it really is. And once you... have the courage of confessing to yourself this is, this is where we are, then there's an option of finding, finding the other, finding yourself, finding the, the new uh, Kesem uh, magic, uh, and having beautiful children. I think it's quite amazing that the Talmud find it... Um, the right thing to do and necessary to keep this little conversation 2,000 years and give it from teacher to student and t- teacher to student until we received it and we studied it here today. Um, for me, it's one of the jewels of, um, of the Talmud because they wrote those amazing, beloved, anonymous fiction writers that wrote these small miniature stories. They wrote so many... Uh, tragedies, little tragedies. It's not tragedy of uh, whole people. It's little human tragedies of relationships. Again and again, they see and they show us how we can misguide ourselves when we want to do right. These are all stories about good people. They all mean well. There's no evil here. There's no cruel, terrible protagonist. It's all Rabbi Meir and Buria and Rav Chia Barashi and his wife and Ima Shalom and Rabbi Eliezer are all good, serious, deep characters that, that we can look up to that mean well and want to be righteous. But I believe out of these three stories, only Ima Shalom and Rabbi Eliezer managed to, to produce these beautiful children. And uh, I think by this... courageous conversation of just asking the other person when you are annoyed about something, why? Not, being, not starting yelling at them, but asking why in a way that is really uh, willing to listen to the answer. I think that is the beginning of uh, our road to righteousness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.